In this lecture, I will model the literary interpretation of Shakespeare's poem, My Mistress' Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun. To do that, we'll also talk about the form, theme, and cultural context of the Shakespearean sonnet. Poetry is made for the ear, so here we go. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why, then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Okay, well, if you're saying now, what does that mean? Uh, I'm here to help. And you might expect me to help by lecturing at you by you're just kind of running through the list of all the things that are all the symbols and, you know, kind of walking through what this means and that means and maybe explaining some complex words and some obscure references. And your job is just to sit there and wait until I tell you what it all means. Your job is to write it down because there's going to be a quiz. And on the quiz, I'm going to ask you to spit back what you learned. And if you can, then you get rewarded. Okay, well, that's not actually how I work. When I was looking at this text in Google Docs, uh, I thought, okay, well, what does Google Docs tell me? There's this research function within Google Docs. What does Google Docs tell me about this unfamiliar word done? And here it's defined. It's a dull grayish brown color. So I looked up a couple other words that um, I wouldn't expect everybody to understand on the first reading. And here's the definition of damask. That's a woven fabric with a pattern typically used for, you know, fancy occasions. And to belie is to give a, a false representation or at least fail to give an accurate representation. And um, so one way to approach uh, understanding a poem is to go through and sort of replace all the weird, unfamiliar, quirky words with more common, more easily accessible words. And okay, you could do that, but the thing is, poets in every age uh, use the living language of their culture, their time and their place, in order to uh, convey the point they want to make. So we, here's a, a snatch from a popular song. We could go through and just sort of replace uh, any words that your grandparents might not you know, immediately get right away. If we paraphrase this particular text, then we'd end up studying the paraphrase rather than studying the actual words that the artist chose in order to achieve a particular effect. Now, for music, you have the, the rhythm and you have the emotional content of the, or the emotional tone of the instruments and you have um, usually a video. So uh, for a song, you have a lot of information to draw on in addition to the words. In a poem, all we have are the words. And to change those words to make the poem easier to understand, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's like a, a changing the lyrics to a song to make it more accessible to your grandparents. Uh, sure, you can do that, but if you did that, you wouldn't actually understand the artist's original word choices. So as literary scholars, we aim to respect the text and that means respecting the original words in the text rather than working around those original words through a paraphrase. Now, I want to talk a little bit now about form and content. You guys know what a limerick is. Uh, you know, there once was a poet named Will who said as he sharpened his quill. Uh, I'll let you finish that one. Here, here's actually a much better one. A limerick packs laughs anatomical in space that's quite economical. The good ones I've seen so seldom are clean, and the clean ones so seldom are comical. This anonymous poet knows both the form and the content of the limerick, 
the limerick is a, a body poem. There, there, there's, there's, you know, there's sexual jokes in it, uh, scatological humor. Um, it's associated with drinking in working class pubs in Limerick, Ireland. So it's not enough to get the rhyme scheme and the rhythm right. In order to be a really good limerick, says this poem, it's got to be body. Now, you may know the pattern of the haiku. Five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. And here's a little example that I wrote. Juxtaposed concepts. Hinged by a well-chosen word. Japanese haiku. Okay, this example fits the structural definition of a haiku. It's got five, seven, and five syllables per line. Uh, it presents two concepts that are juxtaposed that are linked by what's known as the cutting word, in this case, hinged. Uh, what's weak about my example is that traditional haiku draw their concepts or images from nature, and my example doesn't reference nature at all. So I'm going to revise this, and I'm going to make a better haiku. Juxtaposed winglets, hinged on a wiggling word, butterfly haiku. I've changed a few things around, and now this poem uses the image of a butterfly to describe the shape of a sonnet. And I'm hoping that that wiggling word makes you think of a wiggling worm, you know, the little caterpillar that turned into a butterfly that's being carried aloft by the juxtaposed winglets. Now, I could have just said, at the heart of the haiku is a carefully chosen cutting word that joins the juxtaposed concepts and gives the poem its power. I could have just said that, or I could have said, uh, the juxtaposed concepts in a haiku are like wings that carry the central concept aloft. I could have been a little bit more, you know, colorful in the metaphor that I chose, but those two examples that I gave are just ordinary sentences. I, I didn't try to put those sentences into the tight structure of a haiku. Because I chose to write a haiku, I created something that's different from just telling you my idea. Now, likewise, a sonnet has a particular form and a particular theme that we associate with sonnets. Understanding any individual sonnet you might encounter is easier if you know about the structure of the sonnet and the traditional content of a sonnet. So specifically, this is an Elizabethan or Shakespearean sonnet, a generally 14 lines with 10 beats per line and a very specific rhyme scheme, which helps marks off units of thought in the poem. These first four lines form a unit. Experienced readers of sonnets will look for this kind of structure. Um, four lines together are called a quatrain, and the quatrain contains a complete thought. Uh, now, there are several different varieties of sonnets, and even Shakespeare occasionally varies from the structure that we know is the Shakespearean sonnet, but I, I'm, I'm speaking in general terms here. Okay, the next four lines form another quatrain. This is usually an extension of the idea formed in the first quatrain, an extension, another way of approaching the thought contained by the first four lines. And uh, here we have uh, a third quatrain, um, something's different about that third quatrain. That quatrain comes after what's called the turning point, the, the volta. That turning point um, divides the sonnet up into uh, the first eight lines the, is an octet that kind of set up the problem. The last six lines, the sestet, offer a resolution. And that turning point where we switch from setting up the problem to coming up with a resolution, that's an important uh, part of the sonnet. Now Shakespeare, for his part, often put a lot of emphasis here in this final rhyme couplet. So um, we'll talk about uh, the Shakespeare's turning point in a little bit, but I also want to mention that Shakespeare's final couplets are, are very important as well. Not for all sonnets, but definitely for Shakespeare. So uh, three quatrains and a couplet, an octet and a sestet, volta is the turning point. That's the basic structure that we expect when we find a sonnet. And knowing this structure will help us understand the meaning of any sonnet that we might encounter. Now, Shakespeare's sonnets were published in 1609. Uh, we don't know whether Shakespeare planned to have these published, whether it was an intention or whether somebody did it on his own, or whether the publisher did it without Shakespeare's knowledge. Uh, Shakespeare was, at the time this book was published, 1609, he was already a popular dramatist with an established reputation as a court poet. Uh, in Elizabethan times, people didn't really care too much for standard spelling. 
So we will be studying a version of the poem that has standardized spelling. Shakespeare didn't even spell his own name consistently in the handful of places where we think we found his signature. So spelling wasn't all that important to the Elizabethans. Now, in the days before mass media, if you wanted music, you had to hire live musicians. If you wanted inspirational reading, you could just Google for inspirational poems. Uh, there was a culture of people communicating important ideas and concepts in person at special events, delivering speeches specially made for those occasions. Sometimes they spoke in prose, sometimes they spoke in verse. Um, but you had that culture of people talking to each other and people listening. So I just wanted to uh, place that setting. So I just wanted to put that setting in your mind. The artist who painted this picture of Queen Elizabeth didn't make a portrait on his own and then put it in the window of his shop and hope a passing tourist would buy it. In general, a rising painter would aim to attract a wealthy patron, someone who for political reasons either wanted to please the queen, maybe by giving her this flattering portrait of herself, uh, or maybe uh, somebody wants to name drop, somebody wants to buy a portrait of the queen and leave it in his manor house to remind everybody, hey, the queen and I are buddies. Now, a rising poet would likewise hope that some local lord needed, you know, uh, an elegy to be delivered at a relative's funeral, or an epic poem to celebrate an ally's military victory, or, or, or you know, of course, a love poetry to woo somebody, or maybe new lyrics to a well-known drinking song to, at to attack a political rival. If you had a good writer in your household, then you could draw on that person's talent and really sort of get your own version of events out there in ways that made you look good. The value of poetry, then, was not in the physical book containing the poem. Now, we know that Shakespeare distributed his poems as handwritten documents among his friends, who regarded them highly. But the real value was not in the published book, but in the patron's access to a living poet who could create original work on demand that met the patron's immediate needs. Sonnet is a word that comes to the English a language through the French, through the Italian, uh, where it means little song. It's part of the courtly love tradition, a literary convention in which the poet, protesting that he is so not worthy, praises a grand lady who, uh, according to the poem at least, is far above his station in life. Maybe the poet is praising the grand lady romantically, and maybe there's no romantic uh, actual interest, but the poet is just using images and language drawn from this romantic tradition uh, in order to flatter somebody, maybe flatter the lady herself, maybe flatter her husband, saying, you're a lucky guy to have a wife who's so beautiful. Okay, so now that we've covered the structure and theme of a poem, and we have a, at least a little bit of a feel for the cultural context in which the poem was written, we've covered uh, the three corners of this triangle. I don't overthink this diagram too much. I really just drew it so I'd have something to look at. The general idea is that the words are at the core of what we're studying and the structure and theme and cultural context. That's kind of periphery. Uh, we study that stuff not as an end in itself in a literature class. Now, if you were doing gender studies or you, or you were a historian, then your goal would be to study that stuff. In a literature class, that stuff exists to form a framework that we use to help us understand the actual words that the poet wrote. I can't actually say that I've taught you anything about Sonnet 130 unless we actually look at the words and sort of start uh, walking through it. Now, if you write poetry for fun, chances are you are writing in order to express your personal feelings. Now, if you write poetry on the side or for fun, chances are you are writing poetry in order to express yourself, your feelings, your wishes, your hopes, dreams. It makes sense, then, when you encounter a literary poem that's written from a first-person perspective, you'd expect the I of the poem to refer to the poet. So if Shakespeare used the word I in his sonnets about loving a grand lady, it makes sense to believe that Shakespeare is the I talking about somebody who he loves. However, 
Our literary canon of great poems includes examples written from the perspective of long-dead historical figures and mythological creatures and, and even inanimate objects like, I don't know, like the dwarf planet Pluto. On February 7th, 1979, Pluto crossed over Neptune's path of orbit, making it the eighth planet from the sun for the next 20 years. Labeled as chaotic, Pluto was discredited from planetary status in 2006. This poem is called Pluto Shits on the Universe. Today, I broke your solar system. Oops, my bad. Your graph said I was supposed to make a nice little loop around the sun. Nah, I chaos like a mother. Yeah, well, I love that. Okay, so uh, in addition to learning a little bit about Pluto, we've also learned that poets can, but need not, make their own personal experiences central to their poems. What the expert poet does is shoot for an effect latching on to any language or circumstance or images or content that will achieve that effect. Poets can and do exaggerate or even lie in order to achieve an effect. You may have heard that Shakespeare wrote, To thine own self be true, and that's right, he did. However, we cannot properly interpret these words to describe anything Shakespeare the man might have believed, because as it happens, to thine own self be true is a line spoken by Polonius, a doddering old fool who gets accidentally killed by Hamlet and whose body Hamlet drags around the castle making jokes about how badly the corpse smells. Okay, well, Polonius didn't actually say to thine own self be true behind the heiress after he was stabbed. I'm exaggerating to make a point. I'm lying in order to achieve an effect. Um, but either way, it's hardly a ringing endorsement of the philosophy of Polonius to have him die like this. Now, the actor playing Polonius should, if he's any good, make the audience believe that Polonius has a perfectly good reason for saying these words. But if you are true to yourself, then you're putting yourself above the good of the community. And Shakespeare's plays are full of tragic heroes and also villains who cause all sorts of problems because they put their own interest ahead of the good of the community. So what all this means is that just because a literary text contains an idea, we cannot conclude that the text accurately represents the author's motives and inner life and wishes, etc. Practically speaking, as literary scholars, we differentiate between the poet who wrote the poem and the speaker, the first person I, who appears as the observer or character in the poem. Well, what was Shakespeare thinking about as he wrote Sonnet 130? What message did he want us to get out of his poem? We don't know, and we can't ask him. The intentional fallacy is a term that scholars use to describe the attitude that understanding a poem is all about identifying what the author intended this or that word or image to mean. So to say this is a fallacy means it's wrong to spend your energy wondering about the author's original intent and to privilege the author's intention or what you believe the author would say that it means over what an educated reader gets out of the poem uh, by responding to the actual words in the poem. Uh, if Shakespeare intended one thing and we don't get that out of the poem, but we get something completely different, the different thing that we get out of it makes the poem valid uh, because we don't love poems that authors intend to be great. We love poems that are great, and sometimes a poem is great despite the author's intentions. It is fun to speculate, but a college literature class is not the place to make Shakespeare fan fiction, like this movie Shakespeare in Love, which imagines that William Shakespeare is so uncreative that all he can do as he is writing the script of Romeo and Juliet, scene by scene, all he's doing is spitting out onto paper uh, his reactions to the uh, romantic entanglements that he's uh, going through in his own real life. It's as if Shakespeare has no ability to imagine stuff if all he can do is write down poems that reflect what his life is like. We do not actually know anything at all 
about the specific circumstances surrounding Shakespeare's creation of the sonnets. We don't want to spend our imagination then describing a personal scenario that we feel might have made Shakespeare, uh, might have put him in the emotional state to, uh, to write this kind of a poem. We do know that Shakespeare was well regarded as a poet in a world where the ability to write and appreciate complex poetry was valued more highly than it is today. That's uh, kind of a lost skill. Now certainly much of our world would confuse an Elizabethan, but they had the same brains that we had, and they were able to deal with just as much complexity as we deal with. This is uh, from Isaac Newton's uh, book on alchemy. Alchemy is a branch of intellectual inquiry which turned out to be pretty much impractical nonsense, but some of the best minds uh, produced beautiful, ordered, and complex things by using alchemy as their way of exploring things. Shakespeare's plays are also beautiful and ordered and complex. Then there is nothing about your brain that prevents you from understanding the language of Shakespeare. Of course, you need more exposure to it, but your brain is wired to acquire language. You can do it with some exposure. Uh, the servants and manual labors in Shakespeare's original audiences, they lived in a much more oral world than uh, ours is. They probably had better trained memories for listening and, and longer attention spans for listening. So uh, it's probably safe to say that Shakespeare's original audiences probably got more out of hearing Shakespeare's words on a first hearing. But these were ordinary people, not trained experts. And these were people who weren't going to see Shakespeare's plays because their professor told them to or because the state of Pennsylvania said, you need to get Shakespeare on your transcript if you want to be a teacher. The... Um, uh, these were people who wanted to go see Shakespeare. They paid for it for their own good money because they loved it. And their brains, uh, biologically speaking, are no different than yours. Their language skills are no different than yours. So you can do this too with the proper amount of training and some time. Did somebody pay Shakespeare to write a bunch of poems for a special occasion, maybe to honor a specific person or several different people? Uh, did Shakespeare write a bunch of poems on his own for purely personal reasons, and then an enterprising publisher on his own collected them and printed them uh, without Shakespeare's knowledge uh, to capitalize upon Shakespeare's fame as a dramatist? We don't know. We can make some good guesses, and there are plenty of bad guesses floating around on the internet. We do know that the genre of sonnets is associated with the courtly system of patronage, which means establishing social alliances, including marriages, and so forth. In the tradition of courtly love sonnets, the poet flatters the target of his affections, and over the years, poets competed with each other, making their beloved more and more perfect and more unattainable and more idealized. Shakespeare's corpus of sonnets includes several poems in which the speaker advises a young man to settle down and have kids. Another group of poems describes the speaker's love for a dark-haired woman. Uh, another set of poems describes the speaker's uh, rival rivalry with, uh, with another poet, the rival poet. And there's some poems as well that describe the speaker's love for a handsome young man. Uh, this love for the young man, uh, it's a tender love. It uses romantic language. Uh, the dark lady sequences include some sonnets that are overtly sensual and bawdy and really overtly sexual. The fair youth poems uh, don't. Uh, you could read the fair youth poems uh, as purely platonic love, of using elevated and, and sensual and tender language. Did Shakespeare intend the speaker in all of these different poems to be the same person? Uh, are the two young men the same young man, or are they different young men? Uh, is the speaker who praises the dark lady uh, the same speaker who's praising the young man? We, we, we just don't know. All we have is the knowledge that his sonnets were collected in this particular book. So we know the poet is the same, but we don't know if the speaker character that he created is the same, and we don't know whether uh, this order in which the poems are presented in this book, is this the order that Shakespeare wrote them or would have wanted them to be read? Uh, we can't answer any questions about what Shakespeare intended. Now, what we can do is ask ourselves, well, if I treat 
the dark lady, and the rival poet as if they are the same character. How does my understanding of the poem change? So if you want to figure out, well, is there any evidence in the poem that suggests uh, the dark lady is a poet? Uh, does the text support that reading? Or do we have to ignore contradictory evidence, like pronouns that refer to the rivals as he, uh, in order to treat this rival poet and the dark lady as the same entity? Well, I'll leave that as a theoretical exercise. Uh, I want to uh, walk us through uh, just a little tiny example of an interpretive question that hinges upon language. These are some lines from near the beginning of Hamlet. Horatio and a bunch of soldiers have just seen the ghost of Hamlet's father um, walking around on the castle ramparts. And Horatio says to his uh, fellow soldiers, uh, basically, let's go talk to him. Do you consent? We shall acquaint him with it. And as needful in our loves, fitting our duty. That is, because we love Hamlet, shouldn't we tell him what we've just seen? And there's that needful in our loves. Well, uh, a little bit later, Hamlet returns the, the favor. He says, I will requite your loves. So here we have soldiers and their commanding officer out on the, the, the ramparts of a castle, talking about how they love each other. Well, in Elizabethan England, what did it mean for soldiers to say that they love each other? Uh, does it mean the same thing that the word love would appear in a sonnet? So since the word love in Shakespeare has a broad range of interpretations, uh, we have to look at uh, other details within the, the play. You know, here's Hamlet and Horatio talking about how they love each other. Well, Horatio has no other romantic love interest, but Hamlet has Ophelia. So, you know, it's pretty clear to me that love here has nothing to do with a kind of romantic love, sexual love. It's, a, it's, it's love, it, it, but it's a broader sense of love. We cannot ask Shakespeare what he meant by love in this play or in any of his other works, and we can't ask him what he meant by any word in any of his works. You know, try asking J.K. Rowling uh, what she means by a particular uh, thing in her Harry Potter books, and, you know, I, I doubt she will list for you the symbols she was thinking of. Though we cannot ask Shakespeare what he meant, we can learn by reading deeper in Shakespeare's body of work. The more you read, the easier it is to spot patterns. We can gather from his overall body of work that Shakespeare is capable of seeing the world from many different perspectives. He puts well-thought-out speeches in the mouths of his villains, who do more than you know, twirl their mustaches and cackle. His villains give sensible and emotional and logical reasons for what they do, so that they appear like fully developed personalities, not just obstacles in the hero's path. And likewise, Shakespeare gives great heroes some very human flaws. We cannot, however, use general rules about the sonnet, a sonnet is a love poem, to argue that because this is a sonnet, therefore Shakespeare must have been in love with the person the poem is talking about. So if in this poem the speaker is in love with X, we can't really draw any factual conclusions that, therefore, Shakespeare must also have been in love with X. Uh, we can't make that kind of one-to-one -one connection. Well, what can we turn to to help us understand a poem? Here's our triangle again. We can learn about the structure, we can learn about the general theme, uh, and we can also learn about the cultural context. So I want to talk now about the general context in which sonnet writing existed in Elizabethan England. We don't know why Shakespeare wrote Sonnet 130, but we do have an idea of why people liked sonnets and why poets wanted to write them. So let's talk a little bit about the culture in which sonnet writing emerged. Shakespeare rose to success in Elizabethan England, a period so named for the reign of Queen Elizabeth, 1558 to 1630, that's nearly half a century, her reign was a very successful reign. It featured the expansion of the British Empire, a lot of religious controversy. Her father was Henry VIII, whose multiple politically motivated marriages caused a rift between England and the Pope. 
uh, during her reign, we saw a rise of the merchant class. We saw outbreaks of the plague, and we saw scientific discoveries around the world that paved the way for the scientific method and the industrial revolution. Elizabeth herself was known for having bright red hair and fair skin, and fashionable ladies tried to emulate that fair complexion. And conventional love poetry would have praised uh, the woman's appearance in terms of the current standards of fair skin, fair haired beauty. Okay, well, all that's quite a lot of stuff that I just threw at you. But notice, I'm not telling you what the poem means. Uh, I'm not giving you a list of arbitrary statements about what you should think when you read the poem. What I'm doing is I'm giving you some verifiable historical observations that we can use as a base to support an informed interpretation of what the poem means. So let's return to that most important source, the thing at the heart of the matter, the actual words that make up the poem. Here is the first quatrain, which opens up with My Mistress, which establishes this poem firmly within the courtly tradition of love poetry. But this poem is not addressed to the mistress, but rather to some other person that the speaker feels a need to offer an explanation. Now, in these first four lines, we have four brief comparisons. Her eyes are nothing like the sun, corals far more red than her lips. Uh, her skin looks gray compared to snow. This bit about black wires, well, on one level, this bit is just comparing her hair to black wires. Uh, it's black as opposed to fair, fair hair. But let's think about that word wire for a moment. You and I encounter wires everywhere, but when I was rereading this poem for this lecture, it struck me that Benjamin Franklin, who lived about 200 years after the Elizabethans, uh, Franklin was just beginning to understand electricity. So whatever the word wires meant to Elizabethans is probably very different from what it means to us. So I, I went online, I looked up history of electricity, and I learned that in 1600, a guy named William Gilbert, who was a physician in Queen Elizabeth's court, who was there around the time Shakespeare was working, uh, published a book that first used the word electrica. So the guy that coined the word electricity was working in Shakespeare's town around the time that Shakespeare was writing. It's theoretically possible that Shakespeare might have seen a demonstration of electricity of some sort. Uh, but, well, mm, I don't know, the word electricity doesn't appear in the poem anywhere. There are no references to things like charges or shocks or force. There are no other metaphors that suggest this poet is playing with electricity. Um, so I went online and I looked up Elizabethan wire. And I learned that this fancy wired ruff that you see sticking up on everybody's collars in Elizabethan portraits, uh, that was constructed with a framework of thin, flexible metal rods. Um, I also checked a dictionary and found that the word wire comes from the Latin word for weave. And somewhere in my reading, I learned that silver and gold strands, wires, were decorative elements in the Elizabethan court, particularly in hairdos. So I, I love exploring representations of technology and literature, but it looks like this particular poem uh, won't be able to sustain such a reading. Silver and gold are light-colored metals, and fair hair is part of that fair skin beauty ideal. So it's fitting, then, that this poem, uh, which states the mistress does not match the fair, bright ideal in terms of eyes, lips, or skin, it's fitting that it would also say that her hair, uh, if it's decorative wire, those wires are not made out of a shiny, valuable golden material, but something black. First four this first quatrain had four short comparisons, but this second quatrain has two longer ones. Uh, damask is uh, a woven pattern used on fancy linen, and a rose damask, you know, a, a you know, rose woven into fancy cloth. Uh, if it had been spelled, by the way, with an ed instead of an apostrophe d, that would be uh, damasked. But the apostrophe tells us that that's uh, just two syllables, damasked. Okay. It would be conventional to say the roses in the mistress's cheeks are more beautiful than any painted roses, more beautiful than any real rose. Her eyes brighter than the sun, lips redder than coral, etc. But that's not what the poet is doing here. To us, the word reek means to stink. 
But a good dictionary will give additional definitions that convey the idea that the word also more generally means give off steam, fumes, vapor, smoke, etc., without any specific reference that those emissions have a bad smell. Uh, having said that, the word reek was also used to refer to persons and animals in a heated and perspiring state, which suggests, at the very least, that Shakespeare's original audiences would have known that this was an iffy word. Um, clearly, Elizabethans would have known that this word is putting the mistress in an unflattering light. And the fact that Shakespeare builds up to this word, uh, setting up this word cheeks, uh, the rhyme scheme two lines before it, so that the quatrain can end on what looks like a completely inept word choice by an inept poet who ends up uh, at the turning point of the poem uh, insulting his mistress. We expect the sonnet to have a reversal at this point, and oh boy has the poet put himself in, in uh, deep doo-doo at this point. Uh, and line nine, in fact, begins with, I love. Uh, here the poet is admitting that, I don't know, is he saying, maybe I was a little harsh on you, I, I love her, there's a switch here. Previously he's only criticized, now he says he likes listening to her speak. So um, uh, he's being a little bit more positive here. Uh, music is more pleasing than her voice, but that doesn't mean that she has a grating voice. Maybe her voice is just slightly less pleasing. Uh, I grant I never saw a goddess go. He doesn't say she has an awkward, clumsy gait. He just says she walks on the ground, unlike a goddess who uh, apparently floats. Now, Shakespeare was known for making usually a bigger deal about this final couplet than his uh, contemporaries would, and here we see this final couplet is what really turns everything around, insisting that it's false compare, such as we might find in the kind of courtly poems being uh, passed around elsewhere by rival poets. It's false compare that hurts the mistress rather than any of these honest things uh, that the speaker has just said. Um, so, uh, it's false compare that hurts the mistress, that hurts any she who has been uh, uh, unfairly compared with an ideal. So at first this poem looks like it's an inept poet insulting his lover, but at the same time, it perfectly fits the form and theme of a traditional love sonnet. Yet within that stricture, it manages to pull off a stunning critique of the genre of the traditional love sonnet. Now, it might have been easier to see that the limerick used the form of the limerick to comment on the limerick as a genre, and that haiku I showed you, uh, you know, a haiku that had the right form but not the right theme, so I showed you how a haiku can comment on the haiku as a genre. This sonnet is a perfectly formed sonnet that points out how stupid conventional sonnets are. I like to think of that word reeks like a, a clown in a circus act who's tottering on the high wire and looks like he's going to fall off. And just when you think he's going to fall, he rescues himself with a fantastic somersault and the crowd cheers and you realize he really is a good acrobat after all. So this poem... Uh, is really about the writing process. It's about understanding the tradition in which the poet is working. And understanding the tradition in which the poet is writing is the key to unlocking the meaning of this poem. Did you get that? This poem is really a critique of the genre of the love sonnet. Understanding the genre is what unlocks the poem's meaning. I'll give you a chance to write that down. And what have I told you that's not the correct way to read Sonnet 130. Let's go back to the text. We've already seen that the speaker starts off with a catalog of failings, judging the object of his attention against an ideal that was at the time the current standard of female beauty. The poet's choice of details, the woman's cheeks are not as rosy as roses, she has dark not light hair, her breath reeks, her voice is not as pleasing as music, all those details reveal a shallow fixation on externals. This poem teaches us nothing about the kind of person this woman is, whether she is really worth this much attention, whether she reciprocates the poet's interest in her. While we know that the poet loves to hear her speak, so there's a reference to her talking, the next line compares her voice to music uh, unfavorably, 
and it gives no weight to the content of anything the mistress might have said. It only comments on the aesthetic qualities of her tone of voice. Now, this poem is not even addressed to the mistress, but to some third party. This, the speaker is talking behind this woman's back, uh, delivering a critique of his mistress's body, uh, the body which fails in numerous areas to live up to the dominant cultural ideals of femininity. Even the poet's final insistence that he loves her despite all these failings perpetuates the assumption that a woman is valuable because she is desired by men in that this woman whose skin, hair, deportment, and voice fail to meet the poet's high standards, yet she's still valuable, not because of any positive quality she shows, not for anything she says or she thinks or that she does, but because the poet happens to identify her as my mistress. The speaker's criticism of poets who misrepresent women by false compare in their poems does not excuse the poet's participation in this objectifying behavior. I'll give that again. The speaker's criticism of poets who belie women by false compare does not excuse the poet's own participation in the same objectifying behavior. Hmm. Despite what I said about the separation of the personality of the poet from the speaker of the poem, there are plenty of reputable scholars who disagree with me, who say the proper way to understand Shakespeare's poetry is to imagine that Shakespeare went through events in his life that allowed him to write these sorts of poems. Uh, there are scholars who say that reading the poems in the order in which they are assembled in the published text uh, presents a coherent narrative we can see a plot and a story develop through those poems, whereas I've told you we have no idea whether Shakespeare preferred that order. So I've just presented a couple different ways to approach this poem, and I've admitted that there are people out there who disagree with what I just told you. So should we praise this poem as a clever formalist parody of the Petrarchan sonnets and give Shakespeare credit for suggesting that uh, judging women by impossible standards can belie the real women who fail to live up to those standards? Or, by participating in the culture of sonnet writing, even while critiquing the practice, was Shakespeare perpetuating the practice of objectifying women? I pointed out that in Sonnet 130, Shakespeare only talks about externals and doesn't present anything that his beloved woman says. There are other sonnets in which Shakespeare, uh, not only does he come right out and actually praise his mistress rather than damning her with faint praise, but he also gives his beloved a voice. He quotes her. So in order to answer the question about is Shakespeare objectifying this woman and, and is Shakespeare silencing and objectifying this woman, in order to answer that question, we really need to read more poems. And quite frankly, that's the point of literary analysis. We are not trying to find the one correct answer that will get us full points on a quiz, because there is no one correct answer. Now, I need to be very clear. Just because I said there is no one correct answer, that doesn't mean that there are no wrong answers. There are wrong answers in literature. If you said what we're looking at is a limerick, or you called it a tragedy, or you called it a novel, or you said it was published in 1612, or you interpreted the word reeks as meaning the exact same thing as stinks in the 21st century, any of those statements would be wrong. And any conclusions that you draw based on a faulty statement would also be wrong. Now, there are also many well-supported answers. And the better answers will have more evidence supporting them. My first interpretation of this poem as a talented spoof of the love sonnet genre, and my second critique of the poem as uh, part of the system that it attacks, those are both good answers. Students who disagreed with each other over which interpretation is closer to the truth could still both get A's, as long as they both did a good job arguing their position 
defending their claims with evidence, not just by shouting, not, by, not just by insulting the other party, but by presenting direct quotes from the poem and from history and from uh, our knowledge of other things Shakespeare's written in order to defend their interpretation. The more support there is for an answer, the more the answer conforms with the available evidence, then the stronger the answer is, the better the answer is, and the more likely that it's the right answer. An answer that points out that the references to red and white in this poem could be a reference to the Wars of the Roses, uh, in which the red rose symbolized the Lancaster faction and the white rose symbolized the York faction. Okay, well, yeah, I suppose it could be, but what do we gain from reading the poem in this light? Understanding that this poem uses the colors red and white, which have historical significance, does that make us read the poem any better? Uh, remember, I looked up that reference to wires, and I found out that the guy who invented the word electricity uh, was an Elizabethan courtier that Shakespeare might actually have known. But the poem doesn't really seem to include any references to electricity. There's nothing about magnetism or forces or any puns about attraction or whatever. I had to bail on the idea because I found no evidence to support it. Uh, what I did learn in the process about the decorative function of flexible rods helped me understand the word wire in a different way that has nothing to do with electricity. So even though I like technology, and even though I enjoy looking at ways that literary works reflect technology, I have to admit, this poem really doesn't sustain that kind of reading. We can't gain much by looking at this poem through the lens of technology. If you want to convince me that I should look at this poem as an allegory of the Wars of the Roses, then by all means go ahead. I'll keep an open mind, and I'll be ready for you to present me the evidence that will convince me. Now, what it says on a random web page or what it says on Wikipedia really won't sway me much. I, I have plenty to say about credible sources of evidence versus random web pages, but that's a topic for another occasion. Okay, well, if this lecture sends you away with questions about Sonnet 130, then I think that's a good thing. I'm actually not interested in answering the question, what does the poem symbolize? It's just, it's just not a question that I care about. Instead, I want us to discuss why should we read this poem again. That's far more interesting to me than your ability to list symbols that you found on Schmoop. Okay, so, well, why should we read this poem again? What do we get out of doing so? That's a conversation that I think is worth our time in a college literature class. Dentistors at Seton Hill University, happy reading.